Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Hello, welcome back to a new edition of Thinking Like a Lawyer, the 2018 edition of this year, where we discuss what it's like to be a lawyer, why you would be a lawyer, why we all have anxiety issues because we are lawyers, whatever. Um, it's already, 2018 is already a better year because Mariah Carey started it off by nailing her Times Square ball drop performance this year as opposed to last year. It was amazing. It's become like Punxsutawney Phil, like we evaluate how the year is going to go based on whether or not she can actually do her duties. She nailed it this year. So I think I think things are going well. Obviously, we've already suffered a major setback in 2018. Oh. Because apparently uh, Nick Saban can find quarterbacks from Hawaii to come in at halftime to win him championships. Apparently, that's the way the world works. Yeah, no. it was Any other coach does that, and it's a desperation move that gets them probably fired. Yeah, I mean, Nick it was, does it and he gets a ring. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, it was definitely a desperation move. It just was one that paid off. And Except it's, it kind of was. That's the whole. That's the whole thing yeah. about Saban, right? It kind of. It looks. If anybody, any other coach who did that, it would be a desperation move. But Nick Saban somehow planned to pull his twenty-six and two quarterback at halftime if he sucked. Yeah, I mean, it. It. It, it was bittersweet for me, given that. Uh, that particular player's first choice school was Oregon, and Oregon failed to even bother to talk to him until the last minute, and therefore we lost him. But, you know, good for him. That's not what I have to uh, grind my gears about. To oh, start. thank goodness. No, it's not. this one isn't going to be much better. Actually, no, look, this is the grinding of the gears segment. I'm supposed to be unreasonably angry at something. But here, what I really think is that I'm supposed to be a little bit counterculture on something, and I have a slightly more nuanced take on the H&M coolest jungle monkey in the world situation that, that broke this Ooh. week. So if you haven't been following along social media, H&M had this advertisement out where they had a little black boy in a green hoodie, um, and the hoodie said, coolest monkey in the jungle, which was offensive to nearly everybody. H&M, I think they're Swedish or something, quickly apologized and blah, 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 blah. And uh, Sean Diddy Combs already offered the little guy like a million dollar modeling contract. Um, it's been a big thing. And people have been very pissed about the insensitivity of H&M. And okay. Obviously, the ad was insensitive. I am not defending the ad. Okay. Thanks. And that's been grinding the gears <laughs> with Ellie today. Uh, How, however, right, in Europe and I think in Africa, it's a very subtle point that I'm trying to make. It's a difficult point. Mm. The word monkey is not quite as immediately in every situation associated as a racial slur if that word is used by other black people. Uh, okay. Okay? So, like, I've got two little black sons occasionally in the privacy of my own home. I call them little crazy monkeys, right? Mm. Now, I'm their parent. I can do that. If you came into my house yeah. and called my kids little crazy monkeys, I would punch you in the face. Right. Right. So, right. like, you can't say that. Right. That's mm. not that's not your word to use. Right. Uh -huh. In the context of my own home, it's an endearing. They are. They climb. They're little. They're, they're little crazy monkeys sometimes. They're huh. cheeky little monkeys sometimes. Right. And so my nuanced point is simply this. There is... <laughs> There is a chance, there is a snowball's chance in Sweden that the people responsible for this ad, honestly, at least one of them, honestly did not know that they were being so ridiculously offensive. There's a chance. Now, obviously, whenever these things happen, this is an argument for diversity, because I'm sure if H&M employed, like, I don't know, a single black person who saw the ad first, right. they would have alerted them to this potential problem, to this potential. But I'm just saying, we see a lot of these racialized incidents um, in the world today. And this particular one, I am saying I am not 100% sure, was done with malice. Stupidity, awfulness, it was wrong. I'm not 100% sure it was done with malice. Y yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> most corporate acts of racism are not done intentionally. There are very few businesses 
that intend to aim towards the KKK, you know, sub market. Yeah, I disagree uh, with that. See, that's where. See, I actually think that most often these things are done with intentionality. Oh my! I God. think this one, this this one, I think was an honest mistake. Yeah. Okay. Um, Just my opinion. You don't have to agree. Yeah. No. I mean, generally speaking, people who are trying to make money don't go out of their way to do these things intentionally. They do them because, and you make the excellent point, because they lack diversity, have no sense of what is and is not offensive, and they do those sorts of things. The intentionality is almost always not there. That's why it's not worth making these sorts of excuses and nuanced points for them. You shouldn't do it. I'm not making an excuse for them. I'm saying I understand their position a little bit differently than I understand, say, I don't know Donald Trump's, who is clearly out there being racist intentionally. Okay, not a company, but they, they, fair enough. Um, <laughs> so that happened. So, so Mariah Carey nailed it in 2018. Ellie, still waiting. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, we've got many more of these podcasts to go, and I'm sure the next one is going to land, stick that landing. Um, so what was kind of a big deal towards the end of last year and – winds have changed a little bit, but it's going to become much more of a legal deal this year. And we've got Thornton McEnery here from Deal Breaker, and we're going to be talking about cryptocurrency. What is cryptocurrency? It is uh, is everything and nothing. Uh, Do we all really know what it is? I actually just got a text from a uh, a cryptocurrency trader who said in so many words, uh, it is 99% bullshit. The thing about cryptocurrency, it's, it's what it isn't is what's appealing, I think, and what's been appealing. And even today when it's hitting a real bump in the road, it's that it's not anything. It's not backed by the full faith and credit of anyone. It's not really a currency. It's uh, it's code. It's code that's been imbued with with meaning and value. And it's unregulated. Entirely. Uh, more. Le- yes, more. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what we're seeing today, and we're seeing this week, the beginning of a regulatory environment. But it's the regulatory environment you'd expect from something that's lived on the edges of legality. It's the Chinese basically saying we're going to stop it, whatever that means, uh, and the South Koreans fainting at stopping it. It seems. I mean, we had this news break last night, and it's really it's taken the market for a bit of a hit today that they're going to go in and, and stop these mining operations. But what the real story is apparently is that the South Koreans are starting to deb- debate legislation legislation to maybe curb it, which makes sense considering that yesterday there, there was an assumption by some people who were watching it from Wall Street that it was going to be a bad day because the Chinese were going to scale back on treasury purchases, U.S. treasury purchases. But some people noticed that there's really no <laughs> causal effect, uh, mostly probably because the money going in and out of Bitcoin is so in- enormously coming from Asia that U.S. markets are not really the concern. I was hoping that we could explain that a little bit more because I think a lot of people in our audience um, even the ones that that kind of understand cryptocurrencies at a at a slightly higher level, um, they they understand that this is something that is happening predominantly in Asia, and we're only getting kind of a very kind of follow on effect from it. So, can you explain a little bit like why has this become such a important part of analyzing the Asian economy in a way that the Western world seems at this point still one step removed from? Well, especially the case with China and less so the case with with other uh, Asian governments is that, you know, equity in China finds a way to seep out whatever cracks are left in the gates. Uh, And, you know, that's U.S. For a long time, it was U.S. real estate or other solid assets abroad. Now it's cryptos. I mean, it's something you can go online and it permeates the globe. And there is a ton of they're calling it mining operations. It's essentially server farms that create you need a lot of servers and co- you need a lot of energy to literally and computer time to, to build these things. And a lot of the operation is going on in China. Uh, it's It's been going on there for a while and it, it's a huge part of the genesis of the whole market. And just the idea of just the sort of the way that you can move money is, I think, perceived differently over there and than here. And the, the anti-regulatory thing isn't as frightening. I think there's so much regulation and so little regulation at the same time that they love this gray area, whereas here there's a little bit more of a concern. I mean, last month was when the SEC first cracked down on somebody uh, and filed a suit for a ICO that uh, they said was wildly fraudulent. And he raised $15 million promising that he could get a 13-fold return within a month, which with any other asset, I think you would assume was fraudulent. But weirdly, in December, that might have been true of Bitcoin. Yeah, what was amazing about that story for us is that like, the SEC kind of overstepped. I mean, because it's 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 an it's an absurd claim. What he's saying is absurd, and then you look at what else has happened, and it's not that absurd. And also, the other side of that token is 
every ICO is ridiculous. I mean, the market, my favorite moment in this whole thing for me from sitting on the side, not being a, not even an expert is Litecoin is sort of the number four player in this, in, in terms of size. Litecoin is like light, Litecoin, L-I-T-E coin, uh, has been a major player in this whole issue. And there's a guy, everyone knows, unlike other rest of these, they know who made it, they know who started it, they know who has pushed along. It's one guy. A few weeks ago, he sold his entire he told every he sold out of Bitcoin. He basically divested, and it crashed. Because everyone's like, "Oh wait, maybe this isn't real." And I that day was laughing at my desk, thinking, "Well, none of it's real." <laughs> I mean, you know, like this could happen to any of these coins. And I mean, people are saying it was like a CEO. Well, not really. If, if Elon Musk divested himself of Tesla stock tomorrow, it would be terrible for Tesla stock, but it wouldn't make you turn around and go, "Oh wait, those cars don't exist." <laughs> and some people already think they don't exist, but that's a different that's a different conversation. But I mean, it, it, it's a very odd world that they're playing in, and I think now what you're seeing. And what's interesting to your audience is that there have been profits. The realness of the product can still be debatable, but now we're seeing actual wealth being created from these things. And this is the first taxable year where people have to pay taxes on this stuff. And the IRS is going to, I mean, who knows under Trump? It could be a field day or it could just be a field day, depending on which side of it you're on. There are a lot of, uh, not a lot, there's a handful as far as I can understand of these uh, platforms where you can trade and buy cryptos that are allowing you to, to have like a tax thing going where you can literally pay your taxes as you trade. And they're just like letting you hold it and then moving it over. But I mean, I know some American guys who are starting up these crypto funds who like that. But I mean, honestly, the whole thing is kind of almost a hilarious joke. It's like people don't want to pay taxes on it. That's why they're in cryptos. <laughs> there was a tweet I saw earlier today. Um, I think it was Sarah Gion had a had a statement where she's like, at the end of the day, this is a computationally complex way to say you hate the government. Yeah. <laughs> what is your confident level of confidence um, that American regulators have any idea of what's going on? Like, do you have any confidence that American regulators understand the currency to the level where they could even think about making reasonable regulations or applying reasonable standards to them? Well, my confidence in American regulators at the moment is low, period. I mean, it's a pretty sad moment in the history of American financial regulation. I mean, insofar as it's now been a solid year where we have a government that's purposely undermining the power of regulators. And Bitcoin's kind of a wonderful moment of, like, this is the kind of stuff that can happen. There is the argument that can be made, and it's fun to think about for me because I, I traffic in, in financial schadenfreude, that this could be the next mortgage crisis. I mean, there is an amount of wealth being thrown into something that is so, for the lack of a better word, batshit that we don't know what's going to happen. So, I mean, yeah, my, my, my confidence is low that regulators are fully aware of what's going on. I'm sure there's a creeping understanding. I'm sure they're pulling geeks off the street and, and, and getting them to <laughs> give them a really good sense. But the thing about it, and the thing that's kind of fascinating that underlies the entire, the entire structure of this thing is that at the heart of this is the blockchain, which is another thing that gets thrown around constantly. And the blockchain is almost this counterintuitive base for this entire thing. So, so this is for so kids, this is where I get off the train. No pun intended. I basically understand what Bitcoin is. I do not understand what blockchain is. I do not understand how they interact. So, I have, I think, what I would now at this point term a probably like a seventy-five percent total grasp of, of blockchain. I think I understand it as an idea, and the idea is essentially it's a constant recording of trades. I mean, it's it's really what it is. It's it's every large institutional bank that's been fined in the past 15 years. It is their dream come true that people built for the opposite function of what they're looking for. It's a self-regulatory dream machine. I mean, it, it records everything that goes in and out. So for you to get Bitcoin or get any of these cryptos, it has to go through has to go through a server. It has to be, it's something coming in and something coming out, where it's coming in from, where it's going out to. And it's all there. It's all recorded. It's all, you can't not record it. You can't hide this stuff. So the blockchain, people say, from, Jamie Dimon famously said, Bitcoin is a fraud. Cryptos are just for uh, drug dealers and criminals. But in a way, it's the worst way to launder money because the blockchain sees everything and you can go get it. I mean, you can access the blockchain. Regulators could access the blockchain and come April 2019, they might very well be accessing the blockchain and seeing like who's not paying Uncle Sam or you know, or not, or, or it depends how rich you are uh, at that point. But um, 
but yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, it's it's really what's going to happen. The blockchain sort of exists. The blockchain at the at the, at the center of this whole throwing money around thing is actually a system that records everything. And it's kind of fascinating to see how that's going to play out. But if regulators do start to understand that, the blockchain could play in in a major way. And it's going to play in large banks. Banks are going to adopt it. Regulatory lawyers at banks are going to be dealing with block, probably already are, and we'll start seeing much more implications of it. Yeah, on our, on our side, from the industry perspective, we've been seeing a lot of attention with smart contracts as a possible use of blockchain. Uh, basically, all of these complex, which are more in your wheelhouse than ours, but these complex deals that banks have where if something goes up 3% against LIBOR, blah, blah, you know, whatever, then money gets traded, but it doesn't actually get traded. At the end of a quarter, they figured out how much went back and forth and they settle. These smart contracts that run off of blockchain stuff theoretically would move that money instantaneously every time something happened. Uh, That's the dream of transactional lawyers whenever I go to a conference and hear about it. So that's where law is kind of trying to take this. Yeah, I mean, if if you're of counsel at Barclays, it's going to save you a lot of headaches because some 24-year-old moron is able to shadow trade on foreign currency exchanges if you're using blockchain because if he's not just going to call in orders and then never fill, they have to be filled or they don't exist. So, I mean, that kind of world will be sort of quote unquote fixed by it. There's always going to be a way around it, but for a while it'll, it'll probably get caught up. And yeah. Smart contracts are, are blowing up. I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that I don't understand a recording device or technology that can't be turned off that you still have to turn on in the first place in order for it to then never be turned off again. It could be turned off, but the money will never go anywhere and coin won't move. I mean, in order to in order to move Bitcoin, in order to move cryptocurrencies, you have to use the blockchain. It's, it's the server. It has to go in and out. There's the only way. Thornton McGenry cannot trade Ellie Mistal Ethereum. I can't just pass it to you. It has to go through the blockchain. I've got to sell it back and it's got to come back out. So in order for this these currencies to move, they have to go through this thing. So yeah, so I mean, you, it's not an on and off thing. It has to be on or off. So money, either money doesn't move or it's recorded. There's no gray area. And that's kind of the, the, the backwards genius of it. Not to be the, I'm just going to read clever tweets person, but um, over the holidays, one that I saw uh, that I really enjoyed was from uh, Mike Pearl here, child. But how can Santa deliver toys to every little boy and girl on his list in one night? Me, laughs. It's really quite simple. The items on Santa's list are called blocks, and each block in his chain typically contains hash pointers, timestamps, and transactions. Uh, It does feel kind of like magic when you listen to certain people talk about it. In particular, the security aspects of it, which are impressive. But the way in which I understand the security aspects of it is it's largely unhackable because you have to hit multiple because it's all about confirmation from multiple sources so you kind of to hack it would have to get into multiple multiple sites at once is kind of my understanding so yeah it is hackable it's a it's a it's a crazy crazy thing it's i mean it's it's again it's it's a it's a joke on itself i mean it's 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 structurally hilarious it's a modern market that is Absurdly inefficient. I mean, you go on and it takes a day. It takes a week after you b- b- uh, pay for Ethereum to for it to hit your account. You were saying that you actually bought some. I bought some, and uh, it was amazing. It was as I mean, it was everything I thought it was going to be. It was uh, it was bizarre to watch your money go out into this thing that. You know, it's just your money goes out and this fake stuff comes back, but it takes forever to come back. It's so inefficient. It's 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 on the internet and it's less efficient than buying a bond. On the on on the Dow Jones. I mean, it's I mean, there are there we have, we have these entrenched old markets that we laugh at that are that are light speed compared to this new market. It's bizarre and it is hackable. I mean, there, there's a thing. You, I mean, I've now been uh, given access to some of these like uh, group chats, and I I'll jump in to see what these guys are talking about just to keep myself give myself a vague understanding and. There's a, a major theme is, oh, don't use that exchange. It's been hacked more times than they'll admit. Uh, it, who's hackable? Who's safe? Where you know where is your money not going to disappear from? I mean, the mo- most famous thing was Mt. Gox, which was a huge hack in Asia last year, that like, or two years ago, and I got cleared out and could not explain what happened. Uh, it was like John Corzine, but even made less sense. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, fa- I mean, it, so, it, so it is hackable. So it's, it's a pirate's market. Uh, but it's also 
not. It's it's a, it's a slow moving pirates market. And just just to bring it back to the kind of tax situation, you buy two dollars worth. Let's say at the end of the year, it's four dollars worth. Mm-hmm. How would I, government tax man, ever know that? You wouldn't. I mean, I, I my understanding is because I don't. I mean, it's hold is uh, or it's H O D L is the acronym these guys use. Hold it. Don't put it in your bank account because it's going to keep going up. I mean, you've got this whole world of believers out there that are like, oh, God, don't take your Ethereum and put it in your, your Bank of America uh, account because then the government will see it. And, and then also you're just going to get richer and richer if you hold on to this into the infinite till the, the way Western governments break down and this is the only thing you can live with. So they're, that, they're believers. So the guys who are really getting rich on this are holding this stuff till the bitter end. I mean, there is just trillions probably in a few months of of wealth creation that's going to exist that is nowhere and it's not in anyone's account so how would you know but some people are using it to pay for things online uh so yeah it's very hard to track and it could be a tax lawyer's uh, nightmare or dream i mean the irs is now suing coinbase yeah uh so to get documents to show who has what so i the ultimately the answer to ellie's question is the tax man can start getting from the various people who run the exchanges that people buy these off of yeah, they can get that data. I'm on Coinbase, and uh, if the government finds my my triple digits of uh, of money there, that's going to be a really nightmare. But um, the uh, the the court has already limited the uh, <laughs> search to transactions of twenty grand or more. So hopefully which, you're okay. Yeah, which makes sense. I don't want to have to give back what I think will be sixty dollars of profit uh, by year's end. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean it's a it's a shadow world, and that's the point of it. But again, you have these elements where you have Coinbase or Gemini, which is run by the Winklevi, who are by the way a Bitcoin billionaire, not billionaire because they have a billion dollars and they're two people. And it's driving me insane that they keep saying they're billionaires because you'd need $2 billion for two people to be billionaires. Uh, just, just math. But um, Gemini is, the, is sort of the other Coinbase. They're these massive exchanges. Uh, they're going to have to turn stuff over. I mean, there's just too much money being created. Uh, so yeah, and literally money created because there wasn't there before. But it's, it's going to be fascinating. And I think it's going to play out. It's going to take longer to play out than this taxable year. My, if, you had, if I had to guess, I think we're going to be figuring this out Years from now, even if it's gone. In the end, it is also the strange thing about it is it's a binary market. How do you mean? Either this stuff goes on forever. Either we keep going and, and you know, these things just keep accreting value in whatever notional understanding we have of value, or it goes to zero. At a certain point, if these things drop to $4 day trading stocks, people are just going to dump them. There, there's no excitement there. It's a volatility thing. So, I mean, or they disappear. Bitcoins just have a tendency to disappear sometimes when servers are shut down. So... I mean, you're dealing with a thing where you could honestly hold an asset that is going to keep going infinitely up and create another 10,000% uh, value creation for you or disappear entirely. And people seem to enjoy this. They enjoy this game. And I mean, so if, if you're dealing with something that theoretical, the idea of taxing it, I mean, via con Dios. Uh, I'm going to go back to Minecraft. Um, <laughs> that's a good way to start the year. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Like the the tax issues, it's clear that the IRS is going to start doing stuff. They've already filed a suit. Congress changed around some rules that are going to make it easier for them to go after this stuff. And the SECs clearly thinks that there's fraud going on, although whether there is or not. So this is going to be an interesting year for these currencies. As you know, I'm just going to keep several bars of gold bullion under my bed like I have. No, no, I'm not in. Um, I'm not in. I trust. Are black people even allowed to be in on this? They can only use their earning from H&M on model. Yeah. Like, like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. So great. Thank you for joining the show. Thank you for listening to the show, everybody. You should be subscribing to the show. You should be giving reviews to the show. All those sorts of things on your various platforms that you consume it through uh you should follow us on twitter i'm at uh, at joseph patrice ellie's at at ellie nyc you should read above the law and that pretty much is it uh we will be back soon uh thornton's twitter which i follow but i don't remember it's it at it's at thorntonmchenry.com which is easy to find not not dot com it's just oh yeah at, at thornton, thornton McHenry. McHenry. Yeah, easy right. to easy to spell easy to find Okay, so yeah, you, <laughs> you're one of those folks who got their own name like I did, uh, which is huge. So, okay, so, and that's, and also read Deal Breaker, which is the site that he runs. And with that, I think we're done. Uh, hopefully, I'll see some folks uh, for in the near future at some of these conferences we're going to. And aren't you, uh, going, to, aren't you going to the American Bar Association conference that somehow isn't in America? 
I am, I am. So I'll be there. I'll be at Legal Tech. Uh, yeah, plenty of opportunities to see folks. And with that, we'll uh, we'll drop off now and talk to you all later. Bye. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. You can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.